by your soul. Those are in my soul and use patterns, my mom sold a lot. There's a pattern designer called simplicity. Yeah. And they're, they're known for making simple patterns. Elegant styles but simple patterns. The simplicity of Christ consists of who he is. A part of Christ that's almost never preached anymore. It's the only part about Christ that should be preached. I said in verse 4, for he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached. I thought all this there stuff in verse 4 was poetic. Another Jesus. But I'm seeing now that he's talking literal here. So I'm preaching another Jesus. The church who's been seduced by said the serpent from a simple Jesus to a complicated Jesus. A change so subtle that the church does not even realize it's being switched on. When I was doing it in New York, I had this illegal sidewalk game called Three Card Molly. You know what the game? You have three cards. You place your bet. It sits around. And you lose. Exactly. <laughs> A switch is taking place in the game. It's true the hand is quicker than the eye. They play until the police came, then the person conducting the game got all the money run. A switch has been made on the church <clears throat> where Christ is concerned. They probably tired of me repeating this. But it's a major truth we're looking at here. Whenever God brings in another truth or a major truth, he repeats it over and over again. And after about a few weeks, I says, oh, now I get it. So I'm going to review it again. The message about Jesus being preached, and this is why it's such a deceiving message, because it's typical of here in church. If they hear the name Jesus, they assume the preacher's preaching truth. Automatically. But Paul says here, for he that comes preaches another Jesus. What's another Jesus? A message about what Jesus did. Another Jesus. A message about sitting on how Christ did it. That's another Jesus. Message concerning when Christ did it. I've heard many messages that were, were preaching with an elaborate introduction about the fact that this, this, these miracles were performed at the Decapolis, the, the and a big part of the message about the location. Lengthy introduction. They call it information. He calls it another Jesus. Where Jesus did it? Another Jesus. Why Jesus did it? Another Jesus. To whom or for whom he did it? Another Jesus. The point is this, you can preach about Jesus to your blue in the face and never preach about Jesus. Not this one. 
they're preaching another Jesus, which cannot be done unless there is another spirit workman. And he throws it in there. For if he that comes preaching another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, another spirit, John points out, is the spirit of Antichrist. A spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come to flesh. And when you preach the message that does not confess that he came to flesh, it's going to be one of these categories. See how, how subtle it is? Turn the radio on, prove it today. Turn on one of your Christian station on TV. Hear the message. They're all talking about Jesus, but not from the perspective he's supposed to be preached from. This is it. That's all it is. That's why John, we've got there giving John a minute. That's why John said that any spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come to flesh is of God. Well, what's the big deal? I think it's beginning to sink into you guys now. Question is, what was he before he came in the flesh? He told me clearly that Jesus did not start at his birth. He didn't come into existence in 2 BC. That's why John, it was John in his, in his text, Hebrews, says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. One part is easy to figure out, the forever part, he'll be here forever. But it says yesterday, it means yesterday forever. Mm -hmm. Father? That's why we read in Genesis 1 and 1, there's no date. It just says, in the beginning, God, called by theologians, the day is past. It says, God created the heavens and the earth. Then it says in John, in his gospel, John said he was in the world. And the world was made by him. We got a conflict now. Either God did it, or he did it. And God is trying to show you 50 ways to Sunday that I'm the same God back there. I just got to the discussion with the Pharisees about Abraham. He said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it. And was glad. Now, whatever kind of language you know, it should come across clearly. He's saying, I know Abraham. Personally. He said, in fact, Abraham, when he came into existence, I knew him before then. And he saw my day. I'm the one that made a promise to Abraham by his son. I'm the one that talked to Abraham about Sodom and Gomorrah. That was me in a different format, but it was me. Yeah. And they had a faith behind it, didn't they? Mm -hmm. They said, now we know you have a devil. <laughs> you're not even 50 years old. I said before, had he been 500 years old, literally couldn't have seen Abraham. Abraham got off the scene by that point, at that time, over a thousand years. What does he say in response? Before Abraham was, mm -hmm. I am. I'm going to call Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. You have to have a, 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 a special brain to figure it out. God said it to you all through the whole Bible. That that God of the Old Testament is Jesus in the New Testament. He's about to leave. Go to heaven. He said, I go to the Father. It'd be easy to get confused and think that there's only two or three gods. But he says that's, says that's straight back in the Old Testament. He told Israel, he said, Here is what the Lord our God is, one Lord. What do you have then? You have one Lord playing, holding different roles, different titles, wearing different hats. I can't understand why it's so hard for people to grasp what I do. Because you all do it. I'm a father. My sister in town last week, I'm a brother. 
I'm a son. I'm an uncle. Get the point? Yes. I'm one person. But I hold different roles, different titles. So as God, he's one. But as God, he became a son. John says in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And the word became flesh. If that's not Jesus, then whom? Who became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory? He said, I go to the Father. He didn't leave here as Jesus. Then go to the Father. That would give you two gods. He said, I go to the office of the Father. When the Holy Ghost came down on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached and said, this is that promise of the Father. Not the promise of Jesus. Jesus told me, he said, I'm going to send back the comforter. Yeah. Then he says, I will come to you. But he can't tell you how. As the spirit of Jesus, but the promise of the Father. That opened up a great truth for me. In that it's not possible that Jesus didn't come in a rapture as the Son of God. Don't fit. The one coming to the rapture is coming to receive his people to himself. So he can't do that. He says, beloved, now we're the sons of God. We're the same thing as Jesus. The one that comes to get us has to be in a higher plane than the son of God. It's the Father that comes back to the rapture. Yeah. <coughs> Takes us back. I mean, we can get real complicated. <laughs> this doctrine. Turn to 1 Corinthians 13. I'll read this to you again. Something I read before. It takes you real deep. You're going to study something. Study this. Twenty-one. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Speaking of two different men here. By Adam, the man Adam, death came. By the second Adam, Christ, life came. For as an Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. The first fruits of what? Of those who shall be made alive. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Then come at the end. That's where it gets deep. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. Who should deliver the kingdom? Jesus. When he shall put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign to put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he said all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which to put all things under him. Unravel <laughs> that. The hymns are different. But when he saith all things to put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted. We should put all things under him, and when all things shall be subdued unto him, all these hymns here, the different offices, the hymn of the Father, the hymn of the Son, the hymn of God. I said, be funny, this is not unravel. Then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him. A study of hymns. Will the real hymns stand up? <laughs> that God may be all in all. Which is saying to go through a full cycle there. In the beginning, God made Christ, made him subject, put all things under him. 
And him was accepted who brought things under him. And him, they're going to give, the, give the, the, the kingdom to God who put all things under him that God may be all in all. Start with God, go to God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Ghost, and back to God again. That's why Paul sometimes opens up his epistles. He says, giving thanks to God and God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ. One God, one Lord, but they all play a part in the whole thing. As God showed us recently, let us make man in our image after our likeness. What do you mean, God? There's, there's more than one of you? No, we're going to all play a role. And so Jesus finally says at the end, John at the end, he says, we love him, now we're the sons of God. And it doesn't know yet appear, but we shall be. Well, we know that Adam was made in the likeness of God. What's that like? The only thing we have in the likeness of God is His Son, Jesus Christ, the express image of God. And we see Him, we should be like Him, because we see Him as He is, all the different offices that played a role at that point and bring us into an image made like to God. Wow, I was right. Church say, wow. wow. Take the Corinthians. You get a lot of dislikes from that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> on, on different, different show, programs on YouTube, and say like or dislike. That's going to bring a bunch of dislike. <laughs> Let me just make one more category like, dislike, or confused. <laughs> For if he that cometh preacheth another, another Jesus, whom we have not received, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted. Three things. Mm -hmm. Another Jesus, brought about by another spirit, promoted by another gospel. Mm -hmm. Let's look at that part of it. The another gospel aspect. This another Jesus, this new Jesus, has a different message. The original Jesus said, Come unto me. When you come, take up your cross and follow me. That Jesus preached about a cross. This Jesus preached about suffering. He said, your man comes unto me and puts me second to his mother or father or sister or brother or husband or wife or his own life also. He can't be my disciple because I'm not second to anybody. That was his message. He said, let him deny himself. Now you should know I'm already. The another gospel says, come to Jesus and be blessed and prosper. Is that what's being preached in church today? Listen to him. Turn him on. Before it's all over, God put that part in the message. That God intends to bless you and to prosper you. And that we're, whenever it got me the other day, we're the king's kid. <laughs> when you get into false doctrine, all kinds of things open up. Jesus has not yet been crowned king of kings. Oh, Lord of oh Lords. So we can't claim rights to the king's kids when the king's not a king yet. You follow me? Yeah. At best, it could be the high priest's kids. <laughs> and the high priest 
has made it real clear that to reign with me, you're going to suffer first. Automatic. The new doctrine says you can name it and claim it. Blab it, grab it. <coughs> Speak it out, and it's yours. And God teaches you to be blessed and do well. Well, you know what? I'll concede to all that. I'll say they're right. This was a second argument, and they cut it short. But seeing as how the Spirit, the Spirit's message, is progressive, a change took place in this last church age. The very last one, the Laodicean church. Whatever blessing and prosperity plan the Spirit had, or just another Jesus had, it got canceled. He said, those are my love, I'm going to rebuke and chase him. You can't get rebuked and chase him and bust and prosper at the same time. It's like punishing your kid and buying him a new TV for his room. Well, he's on punishment, so I want him to be a bigger one. He's on punishment, but I want him a new bicycle. He's on punishment by giving a raise for his allowance. What's wrong with that? Back in the day, when I was a kid, no one that long ago, <laughs> when you're on punishment, they took something from you. Yeah. Right, right. Right? Yeah. Right. We didn't have a cell phone. We couldn't take them. We didn't have, we didn't have a phone in our room, so we couldn't take them. We didn't have a TV in our room, so we couldn't take them. What do we have? <laughs> you lost your privileges. <laughs> you could go outside. They weren't that dumb. They didn't have in the house right for seven. You go outside, we can't leave the yard. That's right. You gotta stay in the yard. <laughs> for two weeks. <laughs> if your friends couldn't come over. That's punishment. Back in the day, because you live to go outside. Yeah. Out the yard. You get up in the morning early and go hook up with your friends. That's right. Summertime is the time of friends. Yeah. Early friends. <laughs> you knock on your door and they run up here. You wake them up. You got your bicycle all signed up ready to roll. <laughs> you rode all day. Right? Right. Point is that he would not talk about. Deny oneself and then give you everything. You guys get the point, right? Mm -hmm. He said, Those whom I love are going to rebuke and chasten. That last day's church, he said, Thou sayest, I am rich. Well, if that's the message being preached, blessing and prosperity, he should have. He Praise that church. He said, let us in church got the message. Because they're blessed and prosperous and rich. What did he do? He condemned it. First of all, he starts off that, that letter to the second church, the church that's right now. He said, behold, I sat the door of mine. Which Satan jumped on right away and twisted that scripture. And he says that God's not at the door of your heart. God has never knocked the door of anybody's heart. <laughs> and so when he preached, many believed on him. He didn't say, you know, I'm not knocking the door of your heart. You better, you better surrender. <laughs> he didn't, he, Jesus didn't ask how many believe. Did he? He knew who believed already without asking. And so when many believed on him, he turned to the believers and said, you are my disciples indeed, if. Well, I thought you got to do is believe on Jesus Christ and be saved. Not according to him. He said, you're my disciples if you continue in my word. And continue my word, you'll learn about the keys of blessing and prosperity and be blessed. That's what he's saying. And you should know the truth. And the truth should make you free. What was the blessing and prosperity he taught? Truth. 
The blessed ones, you cannot be deceived by anybody. But they never offer anything. You offer one thing, what was it? A cross. Here's what you get. I mean, when he went back to Peter to restore Peter in the 21st chapter of John, he called him back to preach. After Peter said, okay, then Jesus said, you know, when you're young, you got dressed when we went, whenever you wanted to go. Now, when you get old, he said, someone else going to dress you and something you don't, don't want to wear and take you where you don't want to go and stretch you out. It says he's talking about the death of Peter. That defies logic. You're trying to get somebody, you're trying to recruit somebody to come back to preach and tell them when you come back, you're going to be hung on the cross. I mean, you would think they tell Peter to come on back, I'm going to bless them with a nice size church. You know, you never should do a second offering because there'd be plenty of the first offering. <laughs> you're going to have members of the Yang Yang. You're going to have so many members, you're going to know them. You're going to stand around the offering time and shake their hands and call my name, you don't know who they are. This is what the daughters come in. Now that might make you go back and preach, wouldn't it? That's what they're preaching today. That's what they're being called to preach today. Most preachers today are preaching the idea of getting rich. Mm -hmm. Because they see so much of it. The preacher drives, drives a nice big car. How many preachers drive a Toyota? Do you? The space reserved for the preachers by my like, you know, from that wall there to that one. It needs a lot of room. I'm not preaching against big cars. <laughs> I am preaching against rich preachers. <clears throat> I can't find any in the, in the New Testament. I can't find one apostle who qualified as being wealthy in the Old Testament. Only one that came close. He had a wealthy background before he got saved, was Paul, and Paul said, I count all things done. That might win Christ. Paul basically gave away his inheritance. Because something better was coming. Am I boring you? No, no. Alright. For if he that come and preach to another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which we have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. He says that he that cometh, he's talking about he that cometh with the spirit of the Antichrist. He that cometh with that spirit will pre come preaching another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit. That's what he says in John. Try the spirit. Let's go again. That was the introduction. It's time for the message. Those who are busy today, for the first time, we have two services. The first was over around 2 o'clock. Right? So, some of the faces just will my eyes, I'm just getting started. That means it'll be a 10 minute mess. Right? The center might go past 2 o'clock, I might go to 2 15, 2 30. Yes, then it's all over. <laughs> I'm going to preach your time. Right? So you feel better, right? It's easier going to church when you know when you're going to get out. You know, back in the day, when I was a kid, you went to church and had no idea what's going to end. That's right. That's right. You just going to be late, yeah. right? Yeah. Your friends tell, "Come to church, but what time do you get out?" <laughs> so, well, you know, you get out. You know, you know, you know. <laughs> what time? <laughs> I told you that joke tonight one time. About the preacher, I, I told you before, but tell me to hear. That's what those who did. Okay? Those who did just plug your ears up and change your face. <laughs> this preacher. See, these two kids, one was Catholic, one was Catholic, one was something else, Pentecostal. So the Catholic boy invited the Pentecostal to go to his church. He went to his church, and it was cool. The priest came up with a nice robe on, went through his thing, people stood up and said, and, and peace on you too, or whatever they say. Right? Their little ritual. And the boys asked, well, what does that mean? They brought the whole stuff, opinion, and the boys said, what does that mean? He explained to them. 
They left the church within an hour. Pentecost worked out. That was really mean. The next thing, they, the Catholic boy goes to Pentecostal church. And the preacher got up and called the text, took his watch off, set it up. He said, I'm going to be brief this morning. The Catholic boy said, what does that mean? He said, nothing. <laughs> he said, don't be a thing. I'm going to sit here all day long. <laughs> so I got eight minutes to preach this morning. <laughs> Turn there. First John chapter 4. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. Try the spirits to see if it's the original Jesus or another Jesus. Why? Because many false prophets are going to the world. And you got to try them because they're all preaching about Jesus. You get it? Mm -hmm. yes. It'd be easy to fight a, to spot a false prophet who came out and said, turn to the book of Rudolph. I think it's true. I think it's true. Start talking about some characters you never heard before. You know? Look for a purple and green polka dot of robe. Huh? You go there, you know? No. That book is called in, in my life. <laughs> he be easy to spot. A Harvard spot would say, you know, turn to the book of Matthew and read a story about Jesus. And then preach what he did and how he did it and when he did it and who he did it too and the great miracle he did and never talk about who he is. He turned water to wine because he is God. He's one who made water and made wine. And to show his power, he turned it to wine. Because he was a God that could do it. Yes. Reverend preached a message about the water being turned to wine and, and then turned around to the congregation saying, now, whatever water you got in your life, it needs to be changed. You know? We can change your water to food. He can change your water to money. He can change your water to a job. He can change your water to blessing. Off the water. <laughs> And never preach Jesus at all. That's right. Folks go home to church, this Oh, he preached. Go to church and go buy some wine. I think you've got a lot to do. There's a big five gallon jar of wine. Hey, Lord. Pray over. Listen. He said, Wine is just an example. You can make it anything you want to make. No? Just take it to Jesus and say, Lord, here. Take this water and and make it a raise. <laughs> I understand people with that kind of doctrine set up for such little things. Yeah. Somebody told me one time, I said, no, everything I ask God for, he gives it to me. I said, well, look. <laughs> Take what? Since he works away with you, because he's been known to tell me no a few times. <laughs> In fact, he's been known to tell me nothing. <laughs> I didn't get the dignity of a no. <laughs> He was like, I didn't say nothing. <laughs> he, just, he didn't respond. <laughs> so, did, did you hear me? He didn't say, he didn't say, yeah, I heard you. But no, I didn't hear you. He respond to that question. I said, well, look, you know, if a guy goes up to you for you, then do me a favor and ask him for this for me. <laughs> Pretend it's you. When you get it, just give it to me. If God's going to give you anything you want, go high. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm going to ask God to make this house payment. Just ask God for the house. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Back where you're at it, ask him for the block. <laughs> <laughs> She's that generous. All right, I got four minutes. Hereby know you the spirit of God. I got to correct this now. I got some old doctrine. I'm going to be able to pause properly. Because the preaching message then, then comes to pass. And the church, being under the ignorant wings of, wings of Satan, just stood back in the Old Testament. He said, How do you know a false prophet? So the prophet prophesied something, he said, and it does not. 
comes to pass. Is a false prophet. Well, that's your Old Testament doctrine. I said my mother, mother I said my mother's funeral. I said, if I'm a false prophet, so is Jesus and told apostles. Because they promised on a message that didn't come to pass. That's right. They said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the day rose to Jerusalem, fulfilling Zachariah's prophecy about him coming in. When the king comes in, Zachariah said, that's how you'll come, and the kingdom comes. And what did you say? He said, because they thought the kingdom should immediately appear, he didn't know it's not going to happen today. What well, do you do? Change the word. Was he a false prophet? No, he just changed the term. That's all. That's the Old Testament definition of false prophet. God has updated. Now, the New Testament says what? If any man comes and preaches that Jesus Christ come to flesh, he's a true prophet. A false prophet ain't going to preach that message. It's not about what comes to pass. Follow me? Yes. yes. Whole different agenda now. There's still those in the church who think that, no, if you say something, it didn't happen. Well, you're a false prophet. Well, God's cool this way. I learned that God ain't trying to save everybody by sundown. He gave a date, 97, and then delayed it. He didn't tell us why, did he? But he kept preaching 13 to us after 2007. And so, 97 plus 13, that's the year. That's it. Come. Go ahead. Here come. Were you getting a little discouraged by then? He kept preaching the true message. Everything he said should have happened. But it didn't. Then he said again. He talked to us about Abraham and the one year thing. Okay. I mean, the idea of the day of atonement. Coming on Saturday, if you had a birthday, this, your birthday this year on a, on a Sunday, it'll come on Monday next year, right? Mm -hmm. And the seven years, it comes on Sunday again. <coughs> you got the Day of Atonement coming on a Saturday in 2010, Saturday, 2011, well, that's impossible. Unless you're controlling the time. Saturday, 2013, Saturday, 2014. How do you do that? How do you bunch, bunch those together and pack them all together four times within, within five years? It must tell you something. He can pick and choose any one of them. But he got a bunch of them one time because that's the time. And he's delivered the message to us know that I delayed it so that nobody would perish. I'm not slapping some of our promises that some man comes back this. I got a fixed date. Right. I'm trying to get everybody ready, so I announced them earlier. They weren't ready, I went to the secondary day. They ain't ready, I went to this day. But one day that the flood, it comes. Yes. Yes. He that shall come will come. Amen. Won't tear. Okay, the Lord took up all my time saying that, so it's offering time. <laughs> right? I go back to my message. <laughs>